Okay. Um, Recording has started. They always want to tell us. All right. Hello and welcome. Um, my name is Jamie Seltzer, and I'm the Director of Scientific and Medical Outreach at ME Action. I'm really glad that you could join us today. I want to start off by saying that the seminar content is not intended to treat or diagnose any disease, and what is presented should not be taken as medical advice. We always must say this. In March, ME Action first wrote about the potential for SARS-CoV-2 to give rise to ME. We had seen this occur in other viral outbreaks, and we knew that the scale of COVID-19 would likely mean people would develop post-viral sequelae in unfathomable numbers. And as I began to hear stories of COVID long haulers on Twitter especially, and the immunologic, endocrine, and nervous system symptoms rang many bells. Because as you will hear today, ME-CFS is a complex chronic disease and not the symptom of long-term fatigue. At the same time, we recognize that ME is one among many potential post-viral complications and that others still will completely recover. And we wanted this to contain important information for everybody. So you'll hear about ME, but you're also going to hear about strategies for all people with or recovering from chronic illness. We know that there's no simple process, no single dose pill, no one hour seminar that can address all the questions you may have about chronic complex disease and that everyone is different. So use what you can use and let go of what does not serve you. Today is about creating that first connection, connecting people with ME and people with long COVID and making connections to new ideas about chronic illness that will take time to integrate. We encourage you to ask questions after the seminar and to reach out to us after the seminar is over. Now, next, we're going to start our PowerPoint and I'm going to tell you a little bit about my organization. Hang on just one moment, sorry about that. And I think that Terry is going to actually tell you who I am now. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Terry Wilder. I'm a volunteer with ME Action, and I'm a person living with ME. Um, so I'm thrilled to introduce uh, Jamie Seltzer, um, who you just heard speaking. She's the Director of Scientific and Medical Outreach for the Neurological Illness, Myalgic Encephalomyelitis, Chronic Fatigue Syndrome at the nonprofit advocacy organization in the action. She's responsible for fostering communication between research scientists, clinicians, and people with ME. She's represented in the action at the CDC, NIH, Capitol Hill, Columbia University, and Stanford University. And she's been the invited author and or committee member for National Healthcare Organization's SIHR, which is in Canada, Office of the Health Protection, which is Australia, National Institutes for Healthcare in UK, and the National Institute of Health here in the United States. She works as a research consultant to Stanford University Stanford Genome Technology Center on MECFS related projects. Thank you so much, Terry. Now a little bit about ME Action now that you've heard about me. ME Action is a global 501c nonprofit advocacy organization. We provide resources for advocacy actions with the support of hundreds of volunteers, and we advocate for public investment in research, healthcare, and medical education. We have several different resources, including uh, several social media groups. We create news articles. We have MEpedia, which is our wiki. We do community calls to connect people with complex chronic illness together. And we send out informative emails and our reach is over 35,000 people with ME and allies. We also partner with other organizations for greater impact. Millions Missing is probably the action that we're most known for. We convene in cities around the world, and we fight for better funding for people with ME, particularly research funding. Now, uh, let me pass the mic to Allison from Body Politic to tell you a little bit more about their organization. 
Hi everyone, I'm Allison. I'm a volunteer moderator with the Body Politic COVID-19 support group. Body Politic is a queer feminist group based in New York City, New York, exploring the intersections of health and social justice. After 60% of Body Politic's core team became sick with COVID-19, we created a global support group for people struggling with the virus. Since the support group's launch, we've had over 14,000 people sign up to join the group. The group is housed on the Slack platform to accommodate 24-7 chat and allow for small discussion channels based on community or topic. The Body Politic COVID-19 support group consists of people from all over the world who have tested positive, are experiencing symptoms of, or are recovering from COVID-19. Thank you, Allison. And our other partner in this venture is the COVID-19 Working Group New York. They're a coalition of doctors, healthcare professionals, scientists, social workers, community workers, activists, and epidemiologists, all committed to a rapid and community-oriented response to SARS-CoV-2. Now, I would, like, I would like to introduce Terry Wilder, who is my partner in crime. She was diagnosed with myalgic encephalomyelitis in March of 2016. And since her diagnosis, she has worked with elected officials, public health departments, healthcare providers, the NIH, CDC, and activists to raise awareness about ME and facilitate positive change. She was finishing up her PhD when she became too ill to continue. She is currently a volunteer with ME Action, and she represented ME Action on the Federal Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee, or SIFSAC. She's a social worker, longtime AIDS activist, and ACT UP New York member. She uses the skills she learned from the AIDS movement to fight for her life and for others with ME. Terry's a 1992 graduate of the University of Georgia School of Social Work, where she earned her MSW, and she graduated from UGA with a bachelor's in social work in 1989. And she is our moderator for today. So I'm going to pass this all off to her. Thank you. Great, thanks, Jamie. And thanks everybody for joining us today. I'm really excited that everybody's here with us. Um, you know, we're stronger when we are together. And so this is a great platform for us to learn together and fight together. So our topic today is MECFS and COVID-19. What's the connection? Next, please. And I have the honor of introducing Dr. Lucinda Bateman. Uh, Dr. Bateman graduated with honors from John Hopkins School of Medicine, um, where she completed her internal uh, medicine residency at the University of Utah, and was a general internist in Salt Lake City for 10 years. During that period, she recognized the need for advances in diagnosis and treatment of multi-symptom chronic illnesses like ME-CFS and fibromyalgia. She left general practice and formed the Fatigue Consultation Clinic in 2000 to learn more about these illnesses. In 2015, she left private practice and formed the Bateman Horn Center, a 501c3 nonprofit organization with a mission to improve the lives of people with fibromyalgia and MECFS through clinical care, education, and research. Since 2002, she's participated in more than 50 clinical trials including collaborations with researchers from the University of Utah, Columbia, Harvard, Nova Southeastern, Stanford, Jackson Laboratory, the National Institutes of Health, and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She was part of the Fibro Collaborative that created expert treatment guidelines for fibromyalgia. She has served on the board of the International Association for Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, Myalgic Encephalomyelitis, and was the author of the primer for MECFS. She was invited to participate as a clinical expert on a committee of the Institute of Medicine to review the literature and recommend new clinical diagnostic criteria for MECFS. This report was published in 2015. She has a passion for advancing the knowledge and skills of medical providers and in order to prove the lives of underserved patients. So welcome, Dr. Bateman. I'm gonna turn it over to you for your presentation. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, this, uh, we're, I'm calling this uh, my talk, MECFS 101, uh, as we're all talking about it, um, because a lot of people may not understand quite what it is. 
um, but it is a chronic, debilitating, multi-system illness characterized by central and peripheral nervous system disease, immune manifestations, um, and impaired cellular metabolism. It, it's largely thought to be a post-viral or post-infection syndrome. Um, thanks, next slide. <clears throat> so what does MECF have to do with, have to do with COVID-19? And we're all familiar with um, this pandemic. This is a virus that's very, very contagious. It impacts almost all systems of the body and it may be fatal in a certain percentage, especially in high risk groups. And the reason we're here is we're observing that the acute infection resolves uh, in many people, but that um, some people, long haulers are still struggling with chronic multi-system illness manifestations. It's really too early to tell how much comes from the acute viral infection and the associated inflammation and how much could be the development of a chronic post-viral syndrome. And these are just some of the uh, systems that are impacted with COVID-19. Next. Next slide, please. So why does it matter? Um, and here are the reasons why I think we're trying to generate this kind of uh, conversation. And that is our medical establishment is focused on acute illness, especially during this pandemic. And um, our medical establishment really is generally unfamiliar with post-viral syndromes. And uh, many times people whose illness doesn't resolve are just sort of pushed to the side. Um, we know that SARS and MERS, two smaller coronavirus epidemics, uh, we know from those epidemics that there are many patients uh, who have had lingering chronic post-viral symptoms. So recognizing a pattern of post-viral illness, especially if there are known criteria and supportive treatment approaches is empowering and restores some control to your life. And I believe, but we don't have enough studies to, uh, even in our own field to prove this, but as a clinician, I believe that early intervention might improve long-term prognosis greatly. And certainly uh, supportive care uh, can improve function and also uh, quality of life from symptoms. Now people, those people of you uh, and all of the other people out there who have been victims of COVID-19 are also victims of insufficient medical resources, huge amounts of uncertainty and fear, and unprecedented isolation and loneliness. Um, and this has uh, added to the illness burden of COVID victims and their caregivers who may develop emotional consequences. But the most important thing is that chronic stress alters both our HPA axis and our immune system and, and may impair the way we recover from infections, particularly viruses. I mean, last of all, it matters because not feeling believed uh, is another uh, insult that really should never, never occur. Just a little background. Um, MECFS has been called many things in the past. Um, that It's been associated with uh, outbreaks of illness, uh, and uh, the term neurasthenia was published in 1899. Uh, that I think described something like this illness, but uh, eventually became considered a mental health problem. Um, the term myalgic encephalomyelitis dates back a long time. Um, you may have heard it called chronic Epstein-Barr or chronic mono, and the term chronic fatigue syndrome was started in 1988 after uh, evaluation of an outbreak. And because the term chronic fatigue syndrome really didn't describe the illness, the advocacy community adopted the term chronic fatigue immune dysfunction syndrome um, in, in the 90s, in the late 1988 through the 1990s. So really we're describing um, a clinical presentation that's not a new illness. Um, studies have shown that it's worldwide, worldwide and multicultural, and it really, the MECFS criteria are a description of a chronic multisystem illness, likely post-infectious with neurologic immune and metabolic dysregulation. Next slide. We know that many viral infections are capable of causing a post-viral syndrome. I mentioned um, SARS and MERS, but we have lots of science showing Epstein-Barr virus, West Nile virus, 
a number of enteroviruses can all create a post-viral syndrome in some patients. Um, ME-CFS may be caused by the body's complex reactions to certain infections in combination with an abnormal chronic immune or inflammatory response. And each infection results in unique illness features due to the different uh, organs affected by different viruses. And so that creates some heterogeneity in the way the clinical presentation uh, may appear. But people with ME have the same core symptoms that I'm going to talk about uh, in, in the new, in new clinical criteria. Um, but in addition to those core symptoms, we have the heterogeneity uh, of varied symptoms due to the systems affected and the development of comorbid conditions. Next slide. So the most commonly used um, case definition among clinicians who specialize in MECFS, at least in the US, is called the Canadian Consensus Criteria that was put together in 2003. And this describes the presentation of someone and um, with substantial reduction in activity, um, unexplained fatigue, more than six months in duration, um, post-exertional malaise, which is an escalation of symptoms uh, from attempting activity, disturbed sleep, varied kinds of pain, and neuro neurologic and cognitive manifestations. And then at least one from, uh, from two of the following autonomic, neuroendocrine and immune manifestations with some examples there. Um, this is a, a really, this uh, case definition gives a really good description of the variety of symptoms and the debilitating symptoms that can occur uh, to someone who goes on uh, to meet MECFS criteria. Next slide. So we talked uh, briefly about this committee in the introduction. Um, but I was on a committee of the Institute of Medicine that conducted a review of the literature and published core clinical diagnostic criteria in an effort specifically to get doctors to recognize, recognize and diagnose MECFS because the rate of diagnosis is very low. Um, they proposed this committee, our committee proposed a new name and advised that the term chronic fatigue syndrome should no longer be used because there's so much stigma and misunderstanding around that term. But the federal uh, agencies did not adopt the term SEID, um, and uh, they instead adopted the term MECFS, which is the term that we use most consistently now. Next slide. So these clinical diagnostic criteria require these core symptoms, impairment of normal function accompanied by fatigue, post-exertional malaise, sleep disturbances, unrefreshing sleep, and then at least one of the following, cognitive impairment or orthostatic intolerance. And I would say that the majority of people have both of those to some degree. We know that there are many other common symptoms that can develop in the MECFS population, all kinds of pain and immune and inflammatory manifestations, uh, symptoms that, that seem like uh, recurrent infections or uh, uh, some kind of a, a response to an infection, and then neuroendocrine manifestations. Those are the hormones produced in your brain to control the rest of the body. The, if these criteria are used appropriately, um, then they are a really good screening tool uh, to be able to sort out people who are likely to meet MECFS criteria. And the symptoms must be moderate or severe and present 50% of the time in the core criteria. They have to all be present. Thank you. Next slide. So just briefly about these criteria, the lower activity tolerance and a low threshold for activity um, renders people on a range from mild impairment, but difficulty maintaining a, a normal schedule of work, school, and family, all the way to patients who are bedridden and barely able to speak or move uh, and intolerant of uh, light and other, um, other uh, kinds of stimuli. Next slide, please. Post-exertional malaise is, you know, I never liked that term, but 
it's grown on me because malaise is a term that means unwellness and can capture a lot of things. But uh, PEM is really an exacerbation of symptoms after physical, cognitive, emotional, orthostatic, or other stress. It, in more severe cases, it can develop on the spot, but it, it's insidiously difficult because sometimes PEM develops in a delayed way. Uh, so it's hard to uh, go back and understand what you did that triggered it. And depending on the severity of, of uh, relapse symptoms and post-exertional malaise, sometimes people it take days, weeks, or months to recover um, from extended effort that results in post-exertional malaise. And this is really objectively measured now, and there's we're trying to understand it better, but it is quite uh, unique to this disorder. Next, please. So unrefreshing sleep basically means that um, the, the, the mechanisms that control uh, sleep are very disrupted, and um, you can't find it on a, on a, on a sleep study. Um, but in the scientific literature, we know that people have these uh, increased alpha waves, so they have a, you know their, their sleep is light and unrefreshing. They have fewer, less deep sleep. Sleep is fragmented and often has delayed onset, and it can vary from person to person and vary for a person over time. But this kind of abnormal sleep architecture may be a pr major presenting uh, feature of ME-CFS, and it's often very difficult to manage. Next slide. The cognitive impairment um, can be measured, and the cognitive impairment associated with MECFS appears to be slowed information processing, which really interferes with executive function and the ability to organize um, and uh, and sometimes, you know. Uh, being able to pull up memory or create memories. And so it might be the most disabling aspect of this illness for some people, especially in the workplace. Next slide. And orthostatic intolerance really is very simple. It's just a description that you get, you develop symptoms when you're standing or sitting upright that are relieved by reclining. It doesn't necessarily say what the underlying cause is. Um, but it's the reason many people with MECFS are really unable to spend um, as much time um, up and eating dinner and doing light activities with the family because of this need um, to periodically lie down. And there are some formally defined conditions of orthostatic intolerance um, that the medical community would understand. Um, so assessment of orthostatic intolerance is quite important. Next. And the, the significance of orthostatic intolerance is that um, when, you, when the person is upright, there's venous pooling, which reduces return to the heart and ventricular filling and stroke volume. So essentially, the heart uh, doesn't get enough, uh, uh, doesn't get primed enough to be able to maintain a good blood pressure. This results in many of the symptoms of um, cerebral underperfusion. That means not getting enough delivery of fresh blood to the brain and the gray matter, and also peripheral cardiovascular signs. So uh, when your blood vessels clamp down or your in your extremities are not getting um, adequate blood flow or having changes, it creates a lot of symptoms that um, might be strange and uh, maybe people don't even really understand exactly uh, what's creating these symptoms. But they can, this can easily be tested with tilt table tests or also um, a lean test, a 10 minute lean testing. <clears throat> Next. So just a quick comment about potential interventions. Uh, this really isn't a talk designed to talk about treatment, but um, we really don't have any FDA approved treatments or very targeted treatments, but um, really understanding how to pace activity and keep symptoms manageable. Is, is important, you're gonna hear more about that. Um, identification of orthostatic intolerance is important because we have treatments and these can improve both symptoms and function in some people. And of course, we need to help people with pain and with sleep um, and do our due diligence to look for uh, comorbid conditions uh, that might not, maybe not exactly the cause of MECFS, but may be contributing to symptoms, whether it's low vitamin D or 
other nutritional, nutritional deficiencies, low iron causing restless legs. And it's helpful for patients to, to have added, learn how to adapt to the sensory sensitivities uh, and, and blunt these symptoms to add uh, to the quality of life. And I really encourage people to do energy saving um, um, things like using wheelchairs and handicapped parking stickers to conserve their precious energy. Next slide. So I'm, I want to put these up here as my final slide because um, these uh, are these are diagnoses uh, recognized. We call them comorbid conditions because they can stand alone uh, as a, a condition without any association with ME/CFS. But we know that people with ME/CFS develop many of these uh, types of immune and pain and neurologic syndromes and identification of them can be helpful in treatment. And it's a language doctors understand even if they're not ready to uh, wrap their minds around the term ME-CFS. So thank you very much for the opportunity to do this. I just, uh, I wanna say that um, we, the reason that ME-CFS is not diagnosed for six months is that many cases of post-viral uh, syndrome gradually improve. So uh, we want to be able to help people who, who may uh, have those kind of consequences, but you should also remain optimistic and take very good care of yourself uh, in the course of any kind of a, of a viral or other infection. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bateman. Um, so our next series of speakers is a wonderful group of people um, who are gonna share about their lived experiences with ME. And I'm first going to introduce Brian Baztag, um, a little bit about him. Uh, before becoming ill in 2012 with myalgic encephalomyelitis, Brian worked as a science and medical reporter for over 15 years. Before joining the Washington Post, he had also worked at the Journal of the American Medical Association, Science News, the National Cancer Institute, and John Hopkins Hospital. In 2017 and 2018, Brian was an inpatient in, a, in an ongoing National Institute of Health study exploring the pathology of ME-CFS, and he is also diagnosed with myocystis, an inflammatory muscle disorder. He lives on the island of Kauai, which I am completely jealous of. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to you, Brian. Thanks, Terry. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about a non-pharmaceutical approach that anyone can use to try to manage their post-viral illness. It's called pacing. You heard Lucinda talk a little bit about uh, the core symptom of ME-CFS, which is post-exertional malaise, which is a worsening of your symptoms after you exert yourself. And the exertion can be physical, can be mental or cognitive, and it also can be emotional. So pacing means to stay within your energy envelope. Uh, everybody is going to have a different energy envelope. Everybody is gonna have a different amount of activity that they can handle before they get worse and get sicker. So pacing is very much uh, individual in terms of how much you do, but it's a universal strategy that anybody uh, with these chronic post-viral illnesses can do. Next slide. So the most important thing uh, when it comes to pacing is you have to listen to your body and your symptoms. Now there's a twist on this, which as Dr. Bateman alluded to, sometimes symptoms will worsen, you know, 24 hours or longer after the activity. So it can be really hard, especially early in your illness, to connect what you're doing to the symptoms you get later. So, you know, if you touch a hot stove, you feel the burn immediately, you know why you burned your hand. Uh, with PEM, P-E-M, uh, sometimes it can be really hard to figure out, you know, why do I feel so terrible today? And you may have to look back and realize, oh, yesterday um, I read for two hours, or yesterday I walked for a mile, uh, and realize that your symptoms are linked to something you did uh, earlier. 
So, you know, that takes a little while to understand and to learn, but, um, you know, knowing ahead of time that you may be uh, exacerbating symptoms uh, is very important to help you um, prevent uh, PEM. The whole goal is to prevent exacerbation of symptoms. So, um, you know, one thing you have to keep in mind is that uh, when you were healthy, you know, there were a lot of things you did that you would not consider exerting, um, you know, walking. Most people can walk, you know, for a while without considering that being very taxing. Uh, reading, you know, reading a, a, you know, kind of a trashy uh, fiction book. Most people do not consider that exerting. You know, now these things are going to be taxing you. And so you have to kind of understand that even uh, what you would have considered light activity can now be hurting yourself. Uh, for me, one example is um, I recently did a, uh, a Lego set. It was a lunar lander. And, you know, back when I was healthy, uh, doing something like that with my nephews would not have been taxing. But um, I absolutely killed my brain, um, you know, putting this thing together. So you have to have to kind of keep in mind that, um, you know, normal activities are no longer normal. So if your symptoms get worse, you've already exceeded your energy envelope. You've already gone past your limit. So, you know, if you feel any of your symptoms worsening, immediately stop what you're doing. You know, if you're working, you're doing cognitive work, stop doing that. If you're reading, stop doing that. Um, just stop, you know, lay down, rest. Uh, you know, do as little as possible. Next slide. And like I was mentioning, crashes are often delayed. Uh, you know, sometimes it can be a day or two after you do the activity. Um, so, you know, it helps to keep track of your symptoms and your activities to try to match up uh, what you've done with, with your symptoms. Uh, that's, a, that's a good strategy to use. Um, Sorry, I'm just trying to pull up my notes here. And um, another thing to keep in mind is that, you know, during the course of a post-viral illness, people wax and wane, their symptoms get better and they get worse. And when you're feeling better, it's natural to want to do more and to try to resume your normal activities. Uh, this is a little bit of a trap for people with these post-viral illnesses. Um, when you're feeling better, you go want to be really careful that you don't go out and try to do all the things that you used to do. Um, it's still a time to rest, even, even if you're getting, you know, even if you're having a good day. Uh, next slide. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know, activities that used to feel effortless are now requiring effort and they need, you need to account for that. Uh, one rule of thumb that, that researchers and clinicians have come up with is to, uh, you know, do half or less of, of kind of what you think you're able to do. Uh, try to, you know, if you think, like for me, I can walk about eight blocks. Um, this is kind of my maximum before I fall over. So, but, you know, I'm not going to walk eight blocks. I'm going to walk, you know, three blocks or four blocks because I, I don't need to push myself all the way to the limit. Uh, and you want to plan for frequent downtime. You want to plan to be resting, to be, you know, prone and not doing anything. Next slide. So, uh, Beyond listening to your body and just getting experience with pacing, there is an objective way to know if you're overdoing it, and that's heart rate. Uh, there's a measure called anaerobic threshold, which, you know, we don't have time to really explain what it is, but basically your body switches from the normal way of producing energy to a less efficient and kind of more damaging way to produce energy, which is called anaerobic metabolism. And people with post-viral illnesses have um, a very low threshold for where they, when they hit that anaerobic uh, threshold. There's a formula that's here on the page that you can use to calculate approximately what your anaerobic threshold is gonna be. And you can get a heart rate monitor. Uh, they're now pretty good that you can wear and you can set the, the um, you can set an alarm on the monitor to tell you if you're exceeding that heart rate. Uh, so there's a link there that hopefully everybody will be provided. You can read an article on how to uh, monitor your heart rate. Uh, and just one final note uh, here before I go. Uh, go. Um, you know, people who have experience with chronic illness, a lot of times we make calculated decisions about uh, overexerting yourself. So last year, for instance, I, I got married and I decided uh, we decided to have a traditional wedding. 
And I knew that it was going to, you know, I was going to exceed my, all my energy thresholds, but I decided that uh, I wanted to do that. So, you know, we had a wedding and it took me about three weeks to recover, but that was, that was a choice I decided to make. Um, and finally, you know, one thing uh, to keep in mind is that, you know, our culture heavily, heavily rewards people who, you know, push through illness, who overdo it, who overexert themselves. Those, those are values that are baked in at a very young age. And you have to unlearn that because uh, now that's maladaptive. So good luck. And um, I'm happy to uh, take, you know, emails from people uh, later. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. Um, so next, I have the pleasure of introducing one of my favorite people, J.D. Davids. Um, so J.D. is a writer and advocate with more than 25 years experience in health activism, social movements, policy and journalism, and is living with myalgic encephalomyelitis, neuromyelitis, optica spectrum disorder, fibromyalgia, and other chronic conditions. He wrote How to Have Sex in the COVID-19 Pandemic, is a co-author on the first patient-led survey on persistent COVID-19 symptoms, and is working on the Cranky Queer Guide to Chronic Illness. He's a board member of ME Action and serves on the leadership team of the Radical Communicators Network, RADCOMS. JD? Hi, thank you, Terry. Terry, you're one of my heroes. Um, and thank you to ME uh, Action and Body Politic and the COVID-19 Working Group for this important time today. I'm honored to be involved. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about advocating in providers' offices and beyond. And you can reach me at the Cranky Queer on various platforms if you wanna talk further or share information. Next slide. So first off, in order to be an effective advocate in any venue, I feel what's most important is also really knowing ourselves um, and suggest that looking at this uh, through how have you handled past crises or challenges? And also how do you act or react with people in power um, when we're undergoing stress and strain and our nervous system's activated? We may tend to fight or, or take flight, so must freeze up. Um, or we may even appease, especially if we were um, socialized female, just sort of trying to give people what we want just to get out of the situation. Uh, these all and more may happen when we're facing providers. Just prepare for it um, and know ourselves, but also know your strengths and how you handle difficult situations. You can ask a friend or a loved one to help remember how you handle challenges and think about how you work best with others. Do you like to find a good person and do your due diligence to put all your faith in them? Or do you want more of a partnership where there's a give and take about recommendations and you'll want to see the evidence? Those kinds of things of self-knowledge will help you find your niche with providers and how you handle this current challenge. Next slide. So um, also, um, there's a lot going on, and we often may need to set some priorities um, and then know what our strategies are for achieving them. So. Um, However you best tackle information, do you make big long lists, do you draw sketches, do you make spreadsheets uh, in as simple a way as possible, especially if you're facing fatigue, make a list of your priorities um, and then prioritize the ones that are both the most important but that may be easiest or you have the clearest picture of how to take care of them. So for example, I had a long list of stuff going on at various times in my journey um, but there was a point where I was dealing with a lot of dizziness and there was a rehab that dealt with neurological and dizziness stuff 10 blocks from where I worked. So that was a magic uh, fit there, which that's what I put prioritized doing. Um, for each priority, list and track your strategies if this works for you in whatever way. You can even record yourself a memo or a video. You don't have to type. What are your current plans to address this priority? Who could help, including providers? And then next steps or notes. I'm suggesting this not to make more work, but so you can keep a record because it could be really hard to remember this stuff. And that also allows you to share your strategies with a key support person, especially before and after the provider visits, and hopefully even bringing someone along if possible can often be really helpful. Next slide. Um, providers want to do what they can to help us. Most are in good faith, uh, you know, even uh, if we don't get along with them or even if we do. What can we do to recognize how to help them help us? So some providers, different kinds of providers, a nurse practitioner may have a lot of sort of daily practical tools or, or be accepting or know a lot about complementary medicine. Infectious disease doctors are sort of like detectives of looking at the evidence and ruling out or ruling in certain causes. Rheumatologists, 
they got sort of stuck with a bunch of weirdo chronic illnesses that may or not be rheumatological, but they're sort of like had to help people just figure out how to get by. So they may be helpful when it's a complicated mix. So you can also ask what pro providers specialize in or look up online what their publications have been. Bring to them, this is crucial, I think, a two to four page life or medical history summary. Um, I list here some things that could be important um, that you might want to include, and there's other resources available online. Um, and your current information, put in one place so you don't have to keep remaking it, um, a full list of meds and supplements, and just print out the current version if you can, or take a photo of it on your phone if you don't have a printer. Rank your symptoms in order with most severe and most relevant to you up top. I just want to stop and say for me, like dizziness was really affecting my day-to-day -day life. And providers, even those I really liked, many were like, kind of like, they didn't say it literally, but sort of, you're lucky to have such problems to be out and walking around and being a little dizzy. I needed to make that a priority. They saw me as someone who was really fortunate to have mild uh, onset of several pretty nasty potential chronic conditions. Um, have your recent tests and provider visits listed out with a one-line summary of, revolt, of results and recommendation. That's the little central kit for going to a provider visit. Next slide. Um, bring your three questions for each visit in ranked order. And remember, it's what are your, it's, it's what you most need, but also think about who you're seeing today, right? So it's in their, their um, area. For new providers, consider making one of the priorities this. How do you work with patients? What's the most effective way I can use my time with you? Hopefully this is gonna be an ongoing relationship and that's really gonna pay off for you. ME Action has a great um, kit of how to uh, have your information in one place for hospitalization, but it's, it's useful anyway, um, and what to bring along with you. And there's a link there. Thank you, ME Action. Next slide. So some key practices for medical mysteries and miseries that I wanted to Share, get, get the actual copies of your scans, not just the reports. So if you're getting an MRI, ask for them while you're there to put it on a disc for you. And that way doctors can, some will want to look for themselves and they may see things that the radiologist who looked at these things one after the other may not have seen the first time and that they don't specialize in. Learn from all your providers, what are the red flags for urgent or emergency care? When do I need to call this provider? When do I need to just go to the ER? That's going to help life become a lot more livable because I may be having a symptom and when I can say, oh well, don't need to do anything about it, then I can move on and just sort of live with it if I can. Uh, recognize what impacts you the most on your well-being and coping. For example, if you're a parent with young kids, there may be things that are the most debilitating to you that may be very different from someone who um, doesn't have little kids or who does or doesn't go to a workplace. Are you noticing cycles or patterns? Uh, do they go along with a hormonal cycle? What about weather? This will help you learn yourself as much as also provide information for providers. And sometimes we need to change more than one factor at a time. Like we may go to a doctor and they give us five new prescriptions. It can be good to say, can I try these in an in a order that you would recommend so I can see if I'm having a side effect where it's from or if I'm having a benefit where it's from? And also if, you know, we're sort of, having a pretty good month and we decide to drink more water, take naps, and we started three new meds and four new supplements, I'm not that, I often do that, but I also have to realize I may not be able to tell where benefit or symptoms are coming from. And, and, I, and if I jump to conclusions, that may not be in my interest um, to, to figure out what to change. Um, here's some resources, there, there's links to them. But I want to say a couple of things. How to be a patient, it's a great um, read by an RN who grew up going to the doctor, going to the hospital with hang out with her mom who was a doctor. So it's very cool uh, and readable. Um, Tony Bernhard is a, a, a person living with ME, severe ME, who um, has Buddhist strategies for mindfulness that have just been pivotal to me. And now there's a great pocket version you can put in your pocket or put a digital version of the phone in your pocket. I'm real excited about that. And here's a couple articles, one by me and one by someone named Asher Wolf that are thoughts, checklists, strategies for living life um, as it is now and that can help us figure out what we want to do. So thanks again. Great. Thank you very much, JD. 
Um, so I'm now pleased to uh, introduce our final speaker, um, who is amazing, and uh, I look forward to her presentation. So let me introduce Wilhelmina Jenkins. Uh, Wilhelmina is a nationally known patient advocate for the neuroimmune disease ME-CFS. For the past 30 years, she has worked with national and international ME-CFS organizations, including her current work with ME Action. She educates healthcare professionals and supports the patient community, all while disabled herself, often bedridden or homebound with ME. Prior to getting sick, Wilhelmina was all but dissertation from Howard University's physician, uh, physics department, where she was part of a research team at the National Bureau of Standards, which is now the National Institute of Standards and Technology. She also taught physics at Howard University, the University of the District of Columbia, and Lincoln University. Wilhelmina? Oh, Wilhelmina, I think you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. I'm very glad that you're here. I'm very sorry for what brought you here. You were not planning for this to be the way that you spent 2020, but I hope that there's some things that we can share with you today that will make it a little bit easier for you to move through your new normal and what you're doing, dealing with right now. The first point I wanted to make is that this is not your fault. And I want to say that again, this is not your fault. You got caught up in a terrible international pandemic. There's nothing that you could have done to get out of the way of it. There's nothing that you could do to make your experience of that virus any different. It's a novel coronavirus. We don't know that much about it. What we do know is that it causes a lot of different reactions in a lot of different people. For you, you're here today because you're long haulers. You didn't get well quickly but you are still here, you're with us, and we wanna make sure that you know that you're important and that your life matters. The second thing I want to say is to allow yourself to mourn your losses. Right now you're losing some things. All of us have. This is not, I'm not living the life I intended. I lost math and physics and many things that I adored. If you don't mourn those losses, you'll feel like you're eaten up inside by them. You don't want that to happen. It's fair to mourn your losses. Some people may say to you, cheer up, you, this didn't kill you. You're still here. That's not fair. You have lost some significant things in your life that matter to you so much, and you have a right to mourn them. It's not fair to compare. The next thing I'm going to say is don't keep compare to anyone else. There are people out there right now who had a very short course of COVID-19, got well, and went on with their lives. There are other people who are struggling. If you are struggling, that's your path. Don't compare with anybody else. Don't try to figure out what they did correct and you did not. That's not how it goes with the virus. Each one of us has a unique body. And our bodies react in different ways. Your body is your own. You can be happy for somebody who's doing better. You can be sympathetic to somebody who's doing worse. But remember, this is your body, your experience. Don't compare. And for goodness sakes, be kind to yourself. One thing that people with chronic illness have a tendency to do is to be hard on themselves, to tell themselves they should be trying harder. They, they should be pushing. No, do not do that. <laughs> do not do that because you will make yourself worse. Be as gentle and kind to yourself as you would be if this happened to your best friend. Sometimes you can just pat your own self on your shoulder and say, I am sorry. I do that with myself a lot. You can stop saying shoulds. We tend to say, I should be cooking dinner right now. I should be going to the grocery store. I should be looking in on my mother. If you can't do it, you can't do it. Let the shoulds go by the wayside. It's impossible for you to do some things now. And it's unkind to yourself to try to push. Be kind to yourself 
Be gentle to yourself. Be loving to yourself. Just as you would to somebody you loved. Next, I'm going to say proceed with caution. And you've heard a little bit about this already in terms of pacing from Brian. Everything, everything that you do, proceed with caution. This includes activities. This includes medications. This includes lifestyle changes. Everything you do, do it low and slow. That's a, the phrase that we use in the MECFS community. You may say, I can, I should be able to walk. There go the shoulds again. I should be able to go further. Why do I have to stop? No, be cautious. Be very cautious. Brian mentioned doing half of what you think you can do. That probably applies to everything. Medications, treatments. There are going to be people who suggest treatments to you. They, they'll say, you'll be better if you just try X, Y, and Z. Be very, very cautious. If you're not comfortable with it, don't do it. You, you have your own body, and the way that your body behaves is different from everybody else's. Don't do things just because somebody else has had a good effect. Take your time. Go slowly. I, it's almost a joke for me because I used to watch people in my support group and see, mm, they started something. Let me watch them for a year, see what happens. I was cautious. <laughs> Next slide, please. Oh, here we go. Hold hope to, for the future while living in the moment. This is hard, but it's necessary. You've got two things to balance here. This unique coronavirus is something that you don't know what will happen with. It's unique. There's nothing that tells you that things will not change in the future. I've been sick for 37 years, and I still have not heard anybody explain to me that I could not get better. Therefore, I do hold hope. I hold thoughts about what I would do if I were well. But if I dwell on them too much, I can't enjoy the life that I'm living right now at all. Stay in the moment and hold hope for the future. Live the best day you can today. Don't look too far ahead for the day. When you, when you greet the day, say, what can I do today? How can I make this the best day I can today? But at the same time, especially you all with, with, with a novel coronavirus, you don't know what's coming. Something good could be around the corner. Scientists are working on this. Hold your hope. Don't lose hope. But live each day as best you can. Next, find an activity that makes you feel like yourself. Let me explain what I mean by that. Frequently when we become ill, we lose a lot of the things that we thought were the things that, that defined us. You're still in there. You're still the same person. See, look to find an activity that makes you remember that. For me, that activity was advocacy. I was an activist my whole life. It was very difficult for me to lose the ability to be active. But I could find ways working with others to advocate for changes in my, the way my illness was treated. That may not be what you want to do, but that was for me. Each of you can find an activity that makes you remember who you are, to think about who you are, to remind you of the person inside. That's hard, but it's worth it. It's worth every minute of it. And finally, remember that you aren't alone. Remember how many people are going through exactly the same experience you are. And beyond that, the larger chronic illness community. Me who live with MECFS have walked down a very similar path to one you may be walking down. We're very eager to share what we've learned with you. And beyond that, find someone, a buddy, that you can share all the intimate details with. When you're sad, when you're happy, when you're in tears, when you have some, when you just want to laugh. Somebody that you can share the whole thing with. That has to be somebody that you trust a lot. Somebody who understands what you're going through. It could be somebody who is a, a long hauler like yourself. It could be somebody with a different chronic illness. Find a buddy. Just like the buddies that you had when you learned to swim, your buddy can keep you above water. Don't let this illness drown you. Your life is precious, and we want you to live it as best you possibly can. 
all of us are willing to share anything we've learned with you. I have a resource down there, interestingly, one of the same ones that JD gave you from Tony Bernard. She's, this is one particular article of hers from Psychology Today, but she has a lot of articles in addition to the book that JD mentioned. So helpful. I learned so much from those articles and the book. We can live, we can keep living the best life we can while we keep pushing for people to understand what's wrong with us better and to improve our lives and the lives of the people going through the same experience we are. I wish every last one of you the best luck. And remember, we're here to be your partners. We're happy to hold your hand through this. We're happy to talk through it anytime you need us. Thank you, Wilhelmina. I'm gonna turn Thank it back you so to much. Um, so I wanted to uh, have a couple of, of slides to close us out, and then we're going to do a question and answer session thereafter. So uh, first of all, here are two resources you can send to your clinician or clinical organizations. We have um, a seminar for uh, people who work in the clinic that includes anybody who sees patients face to face. It's not just for MDs. And it's also uh, for medical students. We want people to learn about post-viral diseases like ME. We also have uh, a CME, which all, all doctors have to take CME in order to uh, keep their licenses. And it's based on the Sundance award-winning documentary, Unrest, which is about ME. Now, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and in just a moment, we're going to do our Q&A. Um, so first, I'm so grateful that everyone came and listened and I hope that you'll join us again to share more. Um, I wanted to point out that maintaining strength and compassion during a traumatic experience is an enormous challenge and maintaining a sense of personal control and pursuing meaningful work can make all the difference. And in helping others, we can help ourselves. I urge you to join in on our advocacy work and you can reach out to us at info at meaction.net. I wanna draw your particular attention to an advocacy action coming up this next Tuesday. I'll be representing ME Action at the Interagency Working Group, which will include reps from NIH, CDC, ME Action and two other ME advocacy organizations, SMCI and OMF. You can find more information about that also at www.meaction.net, but slash events this time. Um, ben or Terry can put that link up in the chat so that you can copy it, probably Ben wants to do that. Um, the links to all the resources we mentioned today are going to show up in our next email to you, along with a uh, follow-up asking what you thought of the seminar, and we hope that you'll give us your feedback. The PowerPoint will also be in that email. Um, I encourage you to donate to ME Action. We are a nonprofit and our work is funded through donation. So if you enjoyed this, think about what you might have paid knowing the information you would and please consider making a donation if during the time of COVID, which is tough for everybody, you're able. I want to close out before our question and answer session by saying that I am full of gratitude towards all of our presenters today. I can't even tell you. Uh, the people on this call, um, all except for, for Dr. Bateman, are ill, and they have put their health on the line for all of us today, and I can't thank them enough. Uh, thanks to the ME Action staff for their unwavering support of education, outreach, and science efforts. I would not be able to do this without all of them behind me. Thank you to our partners at Body Politic and COVID-19 Working Group New York. And now I'm going to turn the question and answer stuff to Terry. Great, thanks, Jamie. You know, I wanna um, just start uh, by recognizing um, what Wilhelmina just shared with us. Um, I could see in the chat that a lot of people were responding to it and, um, and having some emotions about it. And so I just wanna acknowledge that and just give some people some space um, to, maybe we should take a deep breath in um, and just kind of um, sit in this uh, space um, 
because I know that in a very, very short period of time, many of you who were diagnosed or not diagnosed with COVID-19 have had a lot of changes in your life and you've had a lot of things kind of come at you really quickly. And I just want to acknowledge that and, and respect what you have been going through. Um, our community definitely um, understands that. So I just wanted to acknowledge that um, because I do see what, what comments are being made in the chat and in respect to you all. So as we're waiting for folks to put questions um, in the chat, um, if you'll again put your questions in the chat and you can help us out by letting us know uh, who you want the question directed to. Um, while we're waiting on that, there were um, some chats that were put in that uh, I'll acknowledge and start out with. Um, and I'm just wondering uh, first if we can start with actually something JD that you put in the chat at the beginning um, and, and maybe Dr. Uh, Bateman can also um, add her perspective on this. Um, JD, uh, you put kind of early on our webinar um, that there are uh, some prescription treatments um, for fatigue uh, that sometimes providers may not tell uh, their patients about. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just talk uh, a little bit about that and then maybe Dr. Bateman can, can follow up with her clinical uh, insight on that. Yeah, sure, thank you. I don't know much about the ones I don't take, but I know about the one that I do and I've taken it for many years, which is modafinil. Um, and it's not in the same category as uh, Ritalin or other sort of meth-based stimulants. Um, and it affects me differently uh, than caffeine, which I also use. Um, I have also uh, now been rejected from my insurance paying for it after taking it for many, many years and found out that out of pocket is $20 a month for what I need. So that has been helpful to find out because I now have one less thing to live in fear of insurance not paying for. The amount that's prescribed to me, I break the pill in half. Whenever something's not time release and it's okay to do, and I check this with my doctors, I try I very sensitive medications. Um, and I take it first thing in the morning without asking whether I need it or not. Because before when I would ask myself, that was a judge that was sort of didn't make sense. And I need to take it early because otherwise it interferes with my already troubled sleep. Um, when doing any measure for addressing fatigue, I have found it's important to look at how I'm doing 12 hours later, 24 hours later, to make sure that I'm not inadvertently um, pushing myself to a state that then, you know, creates more fatigue on the other end because it kept me up too late or something. So I'll type the name of that um, in the chat, modafinil, um, and um, would love to hear more from Dr. Bateman. Thank you. Okay, well, um, treatment is a big question, and but one of the most important tools we have as physicians are to just try different things that can help you. And that uh, are, uh, and, and for some reason, that was sort of not done a lot in the last decade, especially by internists, avoiding treating symptoms. Um, so I would say I use a lot of different um, things to help fatigue. Uh, and the name, the main thing to remember is pacing trumps everything else. So uh, a stimulant really needs to be used of any type to help you think more clearly uh, and feel a little better. But it, it you have to be really cautious about using it to get a lot more done, right? Because then you can crash. And I think experienced people get that, but early in the course of illness, that's kind of a hard lesson to learn. Great, thank you. Um, so we also had someone, I think Dr. Bateman, when you were um, talking about the diagnostic criteria in this kind of six month or more um, that you would need to have in order to, if you will, qualify for an ME diagnosis. Um, and so the question is about, um, you know, speaking of six months as a cutoff for diagnosis, what is this kind of two-year window um, uh, that's often referred to uh, kind of for your best chance of, quote, recovery. Um, you know, it's it's certainly kind of a rumor that I've even heard in the ME community, like, you know, if you can kind of almost stop the clock within the first two years of your diagnosis and get 
linked into to healthcare, you have kind of a better chance of maybe not necessarily recovery, but kind of tempering uh, the, the progression of the illness. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that, um, if, you, if there's any kind of anecdotal resources. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to just uh, talk about the six-month window first for a minute. I mean, if you read the Institute of Medicine criteria, uh, or you read more than just the criteria, read into the report, the diagnosis can be made immediately. Um, but it's kind of a working diagnosis. You don't have to wait six months to get a diagnosis. Um, but the six-month window is really before having an, before labeling people with a, a, an, an onerous illness, right, uh, to allow time for the diagnostic workup and for things to recover. So I will just say that I think it's often misunderstood, but this is a diagnosis that can be made much earlier. Um, the, the second question is, I don't know, it's not something I'd like to talk about very much because, um, well, it's not evidence-based. The question about, you know, is there a time after which you're probably not going to get better? I think it's more of a physician's observation that you, you know, you can, I don't give up on complete recovery for at least two years as a positive thing, right? That, you, you know, you really keep working on all the things you can do to help people feel better. But it is an observation among clinicians that if you're still sick after two years, um, the likelihood of a complete cure is probably less. Um, and I try to get people early on to say, you know, to adapt to the illness because it's win-win and uh, don't necessarily be hoping for a cure, but uh, get the best supportive care you can and do it all the time. It's sort of like uh, Dr. Jenkins said, is you live in the moment, right? And every moment you should be doing the best things for your health, and that creates the best prognosis down the road. Thank you. I actually um, want to throw out a question to, to Jamie, um, because I know that Jamie um, does a lot of research, um, and I would assume that most folks not only are kind of talking uh, or thinking about um, kind of prescription medications, but are there things like supplements or other um, uh, opportunities for treatment that may be um, over the counter, maybe supplements? Um, so I'm going to throw this at Jamie, but you know, certainly um, Dr. Bateman, jump in because I'm sure you have these conversations with your patients. So there is a question um, in the chat: Is D ribose and CoQ10 and all carnitine therapy safe enough to refill the body's ATP production temporarily to see if our body recovers naturally after that. Okay, I'll speak generally, and then um, I'll, I will uh, I'll pass it off to Dr. Bateman. So um, we said this at the beginning of the call, but a lot of people came on after that. So I want to reiterate that none of this should be taken as medical advice from your doctor and that everybody's different. So what I'm about to say refers to me and you know, maybe I've heard online other patients also say. So that's all anecdotal. So um, I've no noticed that CoQ10 helps me enormously, personally. I've found that people take very low doses, like the, the little heart healthy dose of 200 milligrams or so. Um, I ended up looking up what there, there was evidence for in multiple sclerosis and using that dosage, which is much higher. Um, and that actually really helped my energy levels. I also found that for brain fog or cognitive dysfunction, DHA, um, which is uh, non-fish oil, fish oil essentially, it's vegan fish oil, really helped with my cognitive function. And if I go off of it, I lose my words again. So I'm, it is very effective for me personally. Other people find that EPA is better, which is the other uh, omega-3 that's uh, predominant in fish oil. Um, I do lactoferrin in the evenings, which helps me to maintain an appropriate immune balance. Um, somebody's asking me what the dose is of CoQ10. I will, I will type that in a moment. It's quite high. It's shocking. Um, and those, those things have gotten me to the level of functionality that you see right now, still able to talk after an hour. But they're not magic bullets. I've had to go up and down. I only be, uh, started one of them at a time. Um, I also do very large doses of B12 and folate and other B vitamins. And there is some research that suggests that um, 
you need DHA in order to absorb B12 and folate. Um, so those two, especially in combination, seem to be effective for cognitive issues and peripheral neurological issues. Um, now, as far as L-carnitine with CoQ10, with um, Carrie, do we remember what the third one was? As far as that specific combination, I have not used it. Um, so I'm going to, as Cindy, you're you're muted. Did you say something? Yeah, D-ribose was the other one. D-ribose was the other one. I actually, I personally haven't found that therapeutic sugars help me, uh, like ribose. Um, but other people say it does. Um, so um, that is um, that's something that that uh, might be helpful to other people. It has not been to me. Uh, Cindy, would you like to add anything? Um, I would just say that I think those are safe if you want to experiment with them. Um, but I don't know. I can't tell you how effective they are uh, like you would in something been tested in clinical trials. So um, that you'll have to uh, work with work on your own. I, I want to make a comment, if I could, Terry, about uh, the recovery a little bit more. This is why I don't like talking about that two-year thing. Um, one of the big problems is we have a, a huge lack of, of research in the first two years of illness. We have no idea how many people get better. And once they get better, they're lost to follow-up. So we have a strange system in this field that we really only keep looking at the people who stay sick. Um, and that is because we haven't had money put into uh, longitudinal trials and uh, the kind of trials that we need to, to understand that better. Um, I will also say that plenty of people get better or get a lot better. Um, so, and especially when they're younger. Um, and even, even after the two year mark, there are plenty of people who go on to have a very productive life, um, even if they're not 100% of their former self. So I just like to have people stay optimistic and learn everything you can. Uh, and you may have to recreate yourself a little bit, but um, uh, stay realistic, but optimistic. Thank you. So I'm going to, I know that it's getting close to 3.15 and I realize that this may be a little long for folks. So I'm just going to close on this final question. And I'm wondering if Brian and Wilhelmina can, can both um, speak to it. Um, so one person says in the chat, I'm very concerned about being able to find a clinician who has experience and can help me. None are nearby. Are there clinicians who are willing to accept patients entirely via telehealth and also in a cash base since my insurance will not pay for this? Any access to experienced clinicians would be great. I don't know, Wilhelmina, if you'd like to go first and then Brian. This is a major problem. I, I, I sympathize with you. There are altogether too few doctors who know anything about this illness at all. It's something that we at ME Action are fighting for all the time, is to give doctors more information. One of, one of our champions is, is Dr. Bateman there. She's been absolutely phenomenal in, in spreading the information. She has a clinician's group that puts out information for doctors, for clinicians, to help them in diagnosing and treatment, treating this illness. If you cannot find a specialist, find a general practitioner who's willing to learn. There are some out there who are, who are very willing to learn. I have heard about many. If you're in an area where there's not a specialist, if you can give your doctor information, there are all kinds of information, video information, written information, all kinds of things that you can give them to learn a little bit more. Dr. Bateman is a champion on that. If you go to her website, you'll see it everywhere. But until we are able to get more doctors knowledgeable about this disease, it, it's, a, it's a real challenge. I think uh, that Jamie can tell you a little bit more about one of the ways we're trying to get clinicians to know a little bit more that's coming up later this month. So if you have a, a clinician who's interested in learning more, there's a good opportunity coming up. Yeah, we absolutely have to recruit. That's that's number one. And we have to get people to listen to experienced clinicians like Dr. Bateman, which is why we're having the seminar um, the 29th of this month. 
And alongside Cindy, who is an expert on treatment and diagnosis in adults, we have Dr. Um, Kathy Rowe, who is uh, the predominant expert on diagnosis and treatment in children and adolescents, and Dr. Mark Van Ness, PhD, and he is uh, an expert in exercise science. That I think that post-exertional malaise and the idea of overdoing it and then having a delayed reaction 24 hours later is potentially the most foreign thing that a clinician will hear. They do not recognize that. So we absolutely wanted an expert like that on the call. It is also true um, that we're doing an initiative to reach out to clinicians um, all over the world um, in order to get them to attend. We've got um, the National Organization of Women wants to um, attend and uh, help us promote. And we've also contacted the Latino Medical Association, which is nationwide, but we're talking to Johns Hopkins right now. Um, so we're, we're pushing it out there so that everybody has access to the knowledge that they need to help their patients. Nobody wants to have a patient come into their office and have no idea what to do or what to say. And we have to give them that knowledge and make it readily accessible. The last thing I would say before I, I get down off my soapbox is that ME Action does have um, a, um, uh, now, we, now my words are leaving. We have a register of clinicians who are ME literate. Um, and I'll make sure that I include a link to that um, in the follow-up email to everybody. Great. If I, if I could say one more thing, Jamie. Everybody, please remember that this is your body. If a doctor is doing something that's harmful for you, or if a doctor doesn't believe you, or if a doctor is doing anything that you find harmful, walk out of the door. You can leave. And that's one of the most important things for me. I have a daughter who had this illness also. And the first person we took her to was dreadful. And we walked and found the doctor that we've seen ever since. You have to remember that this is your body. You're, you're hiring a doctor who's going to take care of you. And if they're not taking care of you correctly, leave. It can't, can't do you any good. If they're not willing to learn, if they're not willing to listen, then this is not the doctor for you. So I did want to give Brian a chance to respond to, to the question that I asked, or if you have any final thoughts before we close out our webinar today. Oh, Brian. thanks. You know, I, don't, I don't have anything to add. Um, so thank you, though. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to thank you, everyone, so much for joining us today. I, I hope that we will continue to be able to meet in spaces together. Um, you know, I think we have a lot in common and that we're powerful when we're together. Um, so thank you again. I appreciate you being here. I know that many of us, this is hard um, to, to get together like this, so, so I recognize that. And Jamie, I'm gonna just turn it over to you to give the final thoughts. Okay, uh, we, have, we have so much that we could say. I just wanna reiterate that like, I know that one hour can never be enough, you guys have been thrust into a world that is really challenging, really confusing, really frustrating. And some of you were disabled already and now have this on top of everything else. So I want to acknowledge that while um, this is, this has the potential to be one of the most frustrating experiences of your life, that we are all here, that there is a network of people who stand ready to support you and that I, I literally would have possibly killed to have <laughs> to have this kind of support when I first became ill. I know that everyone on this call is here because they were so glad to be able to show up in support of people who have gone through what they've gone through. I want to thank you all for using up your precious time and energy to be here. Um, I want to um, thank all of my presenters one more time. Thank you to COVID-19 Working Group New York. Thank you to Body Politic. Thank you to Bateman Horn. Thank you to all of my wonderful presenters who knocked it out of the park. Thank you, guys. Harry, anything to add? Did we forget anything? I don't think so. I think, you know, the other thing that I put in the chat was, you know, we weren't able to get to all the questions, um, but we're going to save the chat and do our best to answer all of your questions and send that out in a document. Uh, we do want to mention that we're going to send out the resources that the speakers talked about. 
Um, and we're also going to send you an evaluation um, because we would like to know your feedback, what worked well, what were things that you wanted to hear that we didn't get to, uh, because we are in the process of, of considering doing another one of these. Um, and it you know, would be helpful to hear what you would like to know next time. Um, so thank you again, everyone. I hope you have a nice uh, weekend and I look forward to connecting with you all again.